Hi. Welcome to Destination Newry. And in the studio today we have Councillor Brendan Curran, who's been a councillor for 28 years in Newry and Moran District Council. Brendan, where were you born? Uh, I was born in Newry. I was born in probably the oldest street in Newry, which was Castle Street. Very historical in every sense of the word. Wow. So, What was it like growing up there? Castle Street was good. Uh, Newry was good. It was very exciting times. I was growing up in a wooden change of times. It was a great time to be to be born and, and to be living in, in the Newry area and in Ireland in general. Uh, there was a lot happening. You had a very close community in Castle Street. All the doors were always open. There was a great gang of, of lads in the street and, and there was always some development to be at. There was two schools in the street so you had plenty of places to play and mess about. And so it was, it was good. Castle Street was good and Newry was good. Well, for the benefit of the viewers, Brendan, Castle Street would have been the back of Newry Cathedral car park area. Yeah, just where I was born directly opposite where the Sacred Heart School was. I was one of the few people who were actually born in the street was actually born on a cold December night on the ground in the kitchen. So there was no wow. Daisy, there was no Daisy Hill because it just didn't happen. My mother had to get somebody to run down to the corner where my father was with all the other workmen to get him up, and it was too late. Frank Mullen had to come and, and do the whole business on the floor in the kitchen. So that's where it all started for me. <laughs> and in, in them days, there was no television or. You know. Well, funny enough, that's a good point, Tony. We probably, and it's not blowing through, my father was the first in Castle Street to have a TV. And it was black and white, mm -hmm. and, and it had wee doors at the side to let the air in to cool it down. And everybody in the street came in to see it, because nobody else had one. You could have seen one in McGowan's shop on Hill Street, you could look through the window at it, but nobody had one. So, f from the very onset, we had one, and then it could no longer afford it. But right at the very start, we were the first one in the street to have one, and it was a huge novelty. Batman, Roy Rogers, and, and all that stuff. So it really was a big. I suppose person. all the neighbours and oh, all coming around to get Bob Corn's TV. It was amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. so, what schools did you go to, Brendan? Well, I went to the primary school, which was just on the same street. So there was no such thing as being sick or not being able to go to school because you're in the street. So that was the Abbey, obviously. That was the Abbey, the Abbey Primary. And then I went to the school where I was threatened to go if I didn't behave myself I went to St Joseph's. So I did go where I was threatened to go and I have to say it, it was a great school. I had no interest in, in school or education and I'm sure they tried their best for me but uh, I had other notions and plans. So I came out of school with a razor and I didn't even shave. That's the only thing I came out with. I came out with absolutely no educational things except a razor. I won first place in poetry and I got a plaque for that in, in my fourth year and that was my biggest educational attainment at that stage. What do you mean they give you a razor? What, can you explain well, that? that? Well I mean when, when you left school, even like leaving prison they give you a, a coat but when you leave a uh, school in those days your going away present was a razor. It was an open razor for shave and I had one and, and I didn't shave and didn't shave for many years after it so it was of no value to me. I see you're still using it by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay Brad, what sports did you take part in? Uh, in school, in school, yeah. In school, I would have been very good at the high jump. Uh, always came third at the high jump, and and the first and second place were always won by the, by the same two fellows. And I always came third. I played football for a while, Gaelic goalkeeper, and I was useless, and I had no interest in it. And uh, the only sport that I really liked was swimming, and and I've always stuck with swimming. I'm a swimming teacher. I know have great interest in swimming and, and I like swimming and, and I still teach today. So you're still a sporting person even well, today? I would swim <coughs> three times a week and I teach swimming on and off. So, What are your main um, hobbies or have you any crafts or things like that? I like the garden. Your garden I, do, I, do, I do like the garden. I like playing a wee bit of guitar. I learned a bit of guitar in prison so I've kept that going. And uh, I do a wee bit of photography. And I've three hens, three cats and a dog. So I like animals as well, so all in that. So you've enough to keep you going? Enough to keep me going, yeah. Hobby. Internet and, and the computer, I'll be very much involved in the computer and stuff like that. You know, so. Very good. I've moved with the times. You've moved with the times, very good. So you're a bit of a web wizard nowadays, Brian. I would, know, I would 
know quite a wee bit about it. You know, I did you shun it. technology back in no, the day? No, I was okay. very hungry. I was very hungry for it, uh, and I would have a good interest in it. Years ago, when, whenever I left school, I got a job with with Francis Brackenbury as a television engineer, and that sort of put an interest in in technology and stuff in me because he he was so gifted and, and so clever, and that sort of stuck with me. So whenever computers came about, I sort of immersed myself in it and have happily had, had a good relationship with him. You know. Very good. <coughs> Francis Brackenbury, he was down at the bottom of Water Street, Water Street when, yeah. with a music shop, isn't yeah. he, is it? Yeah, in yeah. The, Francis was very, very gifted. And a clever man, wasn't very, he? Very, very clever, yeah. Very, very badly invalided, but was, was a very clever fellow, you know, so. Just worked on regardless more, more or less. Well, he did. He was, he was a, an, an advance of his times and, and very capable, you know, and, and was renowned for his, his skills. But it was good crack. I would have good crack. Before. I used to have to put him to bed and stuff at night. And if I forgot to put him to bed, Francis didn't go to bed. You know, so if, if I was down, <laughs> if I was out having a good time and realised at three in the morning I didn't put Francis to bed, Francis was sitting in the chair because he couldn't get up the stairs because he was so badly invalided. So the reception of that would have been frosty to say the least. So on the way up the stairs, Francis' head might have hit the beam by accident as usual. So it was a love-hate relationship with me and Francis. You know, so. So that's whenever you were young then, did you? 16, 16 ish, <coughs> yeah. And what, what else were you involved in, you know, like when you left school, did you? When I left school, I got a great job in Quincy Milestone, which was a tea blending place. Upstairs had a steel floor, and we were tea blenders, and, and you had to blend all the tea on the steel floor. So you would get a, a list of what teas to blend, and you had to turn it three times on this big steel floor with big long tailed shovels. And then I discovered that the girls who was working in the middle floor wouldn't get paid the same rate as the men. And I sort of harnessed my first sort of political protest and they uh, kicked up and I sort of told management that if they didn't take the girls up to our standards that we would walk out. So I ended up being the only one who walked out and left the job, which was, was a big loss because it was good money, it really was good money. So that was one of my first... Uh, political protests and, and I think it was the right thing to do because women should have been treated the same as men and weren't, you know and, and for years after that you know women in Uri still weren't treated the right way you know certain pubs and clubs they couldn't get into and, and I would have took a stand against that as well so see the the, 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 the modern day of Uri will probably find this difficult to believe you know that it's only when you think back to the historical days you know well I mean I, I became a member of an associate member of the independent club because I couldn't become a full member because I was an ex-prisoner. And I asked the question to the chairman, why was there no women members of the club? And the chairman sort of disgustingly looked at me and said, because they're not. And I says, I know they're not, but why are they not? And he said, because they've never been. I says, I know they've never been, but why, why are they not allowed to be a member? So he then quickly asked the next question. He just, he just ran out of without telling me the F off, he just ran out of things to say to me. He just wasn't taking it anymore. And that's, I mean, that's within my living memory. I mean, the independent club, women weren't allowed in on during the day, on, on Saturdays or Sundays, but they were allowed in at night if men signed them in. So, you know, and that's only, that's only, th that's within the last 30 years, so, you know, it's, it's major changes and, and people won't understand that, but that was a big thing. I mean, why couldn't a woman go in? Yeah. There was pubs that had snugs. <coughs> where women weren't allowed into the main body of the pub. So, I mean, that's not a million years ago. It's There's a massive change yeah. going by today, Brent. I yeah. mean, if, if even your father was about today, I'm sure he, was, he would get an yeah, eye over it. Yeah. You know? And there's some people who would like it the way it was, you know. Yes. Yeah. You know? Well, tell me this, Brent. What's your favourite music or bands? Have you? Oh, where would I start with that? I like Van Morrison. Uh, I like Joe Cocker. And Steely Dan, I like Steely Dan. I'm listening to Steely Dan and Buzz Gags at the minute. So I'm, I'm fortunate enough to work in an industry where I get to see all my heroes, the most of them apart from the ones that are dead. So I love music and, and I'm able to avail of it on, on a regular basis. You know, I can see groups now free that I only dreamt of years ago, you know, mm -hmm. in the 80s when, whenever they were, they were in their heyday. So this weekend I'm seeing Beyonce. So. Well, that's enough about that, but I'm talking about music, Brent, Wednesday if you don't mind. Of course, yeah. So, <laughs> so well, no, I enjoy that because I have a good interest in music and so I play a bit of the guitar. and so. Very yeah, good. So your music's a part of your life now, yeah, obviously. Yeah, very much so. 
Um, what's your favourite holiday destination? I don't really have one. I used to love Sligo when, when our family was younger, but I mean, anywhere at the minute is good to go. Out right of the country or in the country? Either. Either way, either way, it's just I've nowhere in particular that I would I would love to go. This year we're actually going to to Spain. My wife's brother was married there twelve years ago in the Basque country, and we all went over for the wedding, and we're all going to go back again this year. You know, the whole wider family, so that'll be good fun. What's your performance? Yeah. Um, what's your favourite food and or drink? Food. Very easy place. You know, I'd be I'd be a creature of habit. I would steak steak and more steak. If I go into a restaurant, like I would never venture for something new. I would always stick to the old thing. Plenty of spuds and and my mother's stew and stuff like that. You know, and mm. hard to beat those Good recipes. traditional yeah. Irish food. Yeah, Irish food. You mean Mrs. Crossy, who who we both know, who passed away there recently. My daughter pushed me into going up and getting the recipe for her soda bread offer. And, and we went up and we filmed her making it. She told me to come up on a Thursday when she was making it. And she was 94 or 96 and sh she allowed us to film her making it. She gave us a recipe and we watched her doing it and, and we have that. That was terrific. So, and, and she told me, she said, you know, this is a very, this is a very old recipe. She said, this is 300 years old. And I said, is it? She said, yeah. She said, you know, there's a story behind that recipe. She says, that recipe saved our family home. I said, Kato, how's that? She says, well, we lived in, in Mayo Bridge, or I think it was out between Mayo Bridge and Durlecky at the time, and the Redcoats, the British Army Redcoats, come out 300 years ago, and, and they were carrying out reprisals and were burning down houses for some Republican uh, attacks was carried out on them, and they came to Mrs Crossy's house, and when they came into the house, there was freshly uh, baked soda bread, and jugs of fresh cream on the table for the family because they were a very uh, cooking orientated family and uh, they sat and they drank and, and ate the bread and they went across the road and they burnt down O'Gorman's house who would be T or O'Gorman's family house My goodness. and and the reason for not burning down Crossy's houses is because they could come back on occasions and avail of even though they stole it that hospitality whereas if they had burned it out they wouldn't and so it, it really was a a unique recipe to have, 300 years old, and and and, and if you, you <coughs> knew Mrs. Crossy or Alice as you do, mm. I mean their bread is unbelievable. Well, it speaks it speaks volumes, and and not only that, they all lived to a big age. Oh it? yeah! Wow! Yeah, Alice was 100. Catherine died, which is 94, 96, and and the sister Mary, I think, is 93 or 4 at the minute as well. So, so it's, it's a good recipe, obviously. Huge, huge history with them, and there is. so cultured, you know. So. And uh, very knowledgeable people. Oh, too. absolutely! Very, very clever people, and were very willing to hand on their knowledge. I have to say, great yeah. family. Yeah. It was great to be handed down like that. Yeah. Um, how do you like to unwind or relax? You know, in the evenings or just when? Like to, I just like to be home, Tony. Uh, I work. Unfortunately, it's mostly weekends and all weekends at concerts and stuff. And I just like to be home. I don't particularly want to go anywhere or be anywhere. I just like to be home. And relax. Just relax, watch the TV, mess about the house. Or well, who inspires you, Brendan, and why? Uh, I'm a very hard person to inspire, I have to say, Tony. Uh, the women in my life have inspired me. Uh, my mother, my wife, my father in, inspired me great. Uh, people like Mrs Crossy inspired me. I would find it very hard to find somebody who, who would be worth looking up to, I have to say, but those are some, some of the people who, who, who would inspire me. Uh, our party leader, Jerry Adams, is, is in a league of his own. And, and what he's had to personally suffer um, and, and our party, but I think he has always, always been out there in advance of all the rest. And so I would be inspired by Jerry Adams and, and would have great time for him personally and, and our politics. So that would be who would inspire me. Very good. Um, what was your proudest day as a councillor? What well, was a councillor? Well, proudest day is, you, you know, you could have a few of them, you know, when my children was born and when I got married. As a councillor, it, it would be hard. Getting elected, I think, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, you were, I'm sorry to break your word, you were the first Sinn Féin councillor elected in New and Moore as a councillor. I was, and, and I was the first in, I think it was 67 years, 
the first Republican, uh, Sinn Féin Republican, I mean, elected in, in Uri. And in those days, it was very hard to get anybody to stand because it, it, it was a very dangerous time. And uh, to represent people who didn't have a voice, I thought it was a very proud moment. And to actually pull it off because, I mean, lots of people in those days voted for the establishment parties. And, and our brand of politics wasn't very easily to, to, to sell to people and, and to get people engaged in. Even though we had support, the media, I mean, you had censorship, you had shooting of us dead, attacks, imprisonment. So it was very, very hard to get our message across in, in a fair and open way like everybody else. So I think that probably was my proudest uh, political moment. Was, was to get elected, to, to give people a voice who didn't have one. People who, who I seen were downtrodden and, and abused and, and murdered on the streets and uh, the victims. That's, so I think that was my, my proudest day. You, you couldn't top that. Have you represented all, all factions of our community? Well, I, I would like to think so and everybody would like to think, but I mean I really did. I mean at that stage I was asked by the Republican movement to become a councillor. That was 1985. I was also getting married in 1985. Uh, I had been in prison for many years and I got out and I found it impossible to get a job. And finally, finally, I did get a full-time job with, with a pension. And the dilemma I had, and, and my wife, was for me to be able to stand as a counsellor, I would have to give that job up, which was a big sacrifice. Particularly in the light of the fact that you went on the dole and, and you get next to nothing for being a councillor. I mean, you get next to nothing now, but I mean, then it was even worse. So that was that was a big, big sacrifice for me. And uh, it was one which I'd done and, and, and done willingly because it was the right thing to do. And uh, I've, I've no regrets about it. You know, I'd, I would love to have still, you know, have been the lifeguard and, and, and had that constant income. Were as I just had to forgo it, and, and that that was a big decision. So that that was one of the big choices I had to make. Is there a big change in your your representation nowadays? The diversity of Newry and Morn. I mean, it's a wide diverse of of different communities. Ah, uh, there is. You know, I think I would have a I would have a peculiar type of following. You know, which which would be outside of of the you know the Republican following and. I've continuously stood in different areas, been moved around, and, and it's hard to keep a following. But I have people who, who like the Republican brand and also who like my brand. But uh, I don't suffer fools gladly, and, and if people come to me and I think that you know they should be told the truth, then I tell them the truth whether that suits them or not. And, and sometimes that, that doesn't go down well with people. Mm -hmm. And Sometimes people think you should be two-faced and, and say the right thing just to get people's votes, and I don't do that, and, and, I, and I never will do that. So uh, it's hard to be current. It's hard to be relevant to people all the time, and I've been successful in that, and uh, that's very hard to do. And, and anybody who's elected would realise, you know, to to get constantly elected is very very hard. And I think part of that is if you're genuine. About about what you do and, and if you have a good workload and, and if you follow up things. And it's easier now to be to be a Republican representative, you know, they're not killing you in the street and victimizing you or your family and, and I think that's an unseen side of it. Mm -hmm. That it's not easy being a Republican. I mean I was sitting at the table the other night with my children and still we still have that threat and, and we worry of that threat of, of danger. To, particularly to our children and, and ourselves, mm -hmm. so it's, it's not easy being an elected representative, mm -hmm. and uh, you can be victimised and, and ostracised as a result of it, and, and your family. So it's 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 not an easy road to go. You know, mm -hmm. if if you were middle of the road politics, or or if you were some of those other non-contentious parties, politics would be a doddle. But the, the, yeah. the brand that I've Followed is has not been easy. I, was, to say. I suppose, especially with the Russians and you know Eastern Bloc countries and Brazil. I mean, they're coming in. All these people yeah. are coming in from all around the world. I think it's great myself. You know, I no, I, I have to say, I, I new welcome, challenges. I, is it? I welcome the, the the new nationals and, and embrace it. And uh, particularly the Polish community would would do bits and pieces with regard to the Polish community. And and there is people who, I mean, today actually put on. 
on, on Facebook, you know, racist comments about, you know, they're over here taking all our jobs. What a load of nonsense. Mm -hmm. I mean, people who are over here are working their butts off. They're doing work that lots of other people might follow their backside doing. And, and I think they add greatly to our community in every way. Yeah. They keep our schools going, they, they, they do the work and, and create work as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I have, I have no problems about the, the change so, of uh, uh, Have you got new challenges then with these new diversity groups, you know? Uh, well, a lot of them are inclined to stay in their own groups mm. and, and it's only in dire situations where, where they reach out to, to our communities. But I mean, there's a lot of things going wrong in, in those communities which they also keep to themselves as well, which I think we all need to, to make an effort to, mm -hmm. to crack and to help them resolve. Well, what are your hopes for Newry and Morn in the future, Bren? Uh, to grow, to, to have uh, facilities and for them to be open and equal to everybody. I, th I think we need particularly the council, I think we need vision in our council. I, I think there's a severe lack of vision in our council, particularly with regard to facilities and, and things like that. I mean, we've just recently opened a mountain bike track in, in Restrever, and, and that's great. And in the same sleeve column, we've opened a, a children's multi-activity playground. But we seem to stop. Once we do, we seem to stop. We don't develop. I mean, there's not enough car parking spaces. Mm -hmm. There should be camping facilities. You know, we need to be building... It's seen as, you know, you've done enough once you've done it, whereas if it was a business, it was my business or your business, you'd be saying, that's great, how can I add to it? What else would people be looking for? And, th and I think that's where our council's fallen down. And there is one or two in the council who has vision, but it's down to one or two, and, and those people who do have any push in them, they're being inundated, and, and I think there, there needs to be a whole rationalisation, and we need to be maybe buying in from, from the business community, people who will put that business edge on, who will get a return for the ratepayers' money it's spent on it. Because mm -hmm. that's what it's about, it's about getting a return. It's not enough just to provide it. Mm -hmm. You need to get a return so you can provide other facilities. And, and I think th there's not that attitude to it on the council. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, what are your fears for New Ray Moon? Uh, my fears is, is, is the violence uh, that takes place day and daily the unseen assaults in the nighttime economy, the brutality that goes on in our streets and, and nobody seems to care. Uh, the amount of people who, who visit Daisy Hill with, with assaults, which goes unrecorded, I mean it doesn't show up in any statistics anywhere, it's, it's seen as private confidential information. And if we seen the true uh, amount of it, then we might take steps about it. And the amount of violence every weekend is, is very large and, and a lot of it's drug related and, and I just don't think that anybody's doing anything about it. I think that, that some of our premises are, I know it's, it's hard for them but there seems to be an acceptable level of violence on our streets. You know, as long as nobody gets killed it doesn't matter if somebody kicks your head in and you end up in, in the brain injury ward. As long as you don't end up on, on the death statistics, nobody's really going to, you know, kick up too much about it. it. Yeah. And and the amount of people <coughs> a, that suffer serious head injuries is 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 colossal. And I mean, I remember meeting a, a young Polish man, a very fit, able, fine lad, who actually crashed into my son's car, and uh, looked at the car. There was no problem with the car, and you know, told him there was no bother. And I found out. You know, just a short time ago, that man is is in a vegetative state. That he he got brutalised on the streets in Newry, and those are the figures which just slip off the radar. You know, you don't see them, and that to me is shocking. And the fact that nobody's doing anything serious about it is, is shocking. I, I really think that the nighttime economy needs to be badly shook up, and, and I think it needs to be led from the council. And until it happens to some of their children, I don't think anybody's going to take it seriously. I just think it's it's terrible what's going on and, and it is going on and it's been allowed to go on and, and I see it because of the industry I work in and I, I know how bad it is in other places but in Uri is, is where I live and that's where I'm concerned about most and I just don't see people taking it seriously enough. And is it down, well uh, do you think it's down to the council, the police, community groups or who, you know what way it can be? Well, well I think the council must take a lead in it and 
why, why do I say that? I say that because the council gives the entertainment licenses to the premises. Now, if those premises aren't proactive, both inside and outside, and I very importantly say outside, it seems it's all right to do what you want outside the premises. As right. long as it's not done in the premises, or if somebody's caused a problem, we'll throw them out of the premises, and then that's the problem solved. It's not it solved. You know what I mean? And the, the police will, will verify that, but I mean, there needs to be a joint effort. There needs to be a licensing issue where premises need to take control of what happens immediately outside and maybe to the middle of the road. Now the premises are torn and say, oh, we're not insured. Well, they just need to get themselves insured to do that. Mm -hmm. Or else maybe they shouldn't get a license because it is so serious and people are being so badly injured. And if, if they're serious about their business, then, then they'll take the outside uh, serious as well. The other thing is about neighbours. You know, people shouldn't have to listen to the noise and, and people over there in Francis Street have had injured as well. And, and until people take seriously, yeah. then it won't be taken seriously as an issue. So I think there needs to be movement with, with regard to that, and I've been saying that until I'm blue in the face, and it seems like I'm going to continue to say it, but hopefully somebody will listen somewhere along the line. Yeah, indeed. Um, what can be done to unify that all the diverse groups in our community? For instance, you know, uh, is there such a thing as a you know, community concert or, you know, is there anything can be done by the, the council and or other groups, community groups to, to get the ordinary people of Newry to know who their new neighbours are? I well, we spoke earlier on about Castle Street and, and when the doors were open and all, and, and Ireland and Newry in particular was always very well known for that, and it's not the same anymore. You know, people aren't as friendly or as neighbourly in, in some areas as, as they used to be years ago because of, of the different threats and you know as drugs or, or the, the fear of drugs and robberies and all the rest of that. Some of the community associations do great work, I have to say. Uh, they could always do better, but I mean some of them do good work. And and I think that's the type of thing I don't think they should be allowed to stay satellite in their own groups. I think there needs to be outbreaks there. I think there needs to be hand holding and and attracting them in, into to our mainstream where, where you can, you know, without offending their, their cultures. And, and I think we do that in schools and, and all the rest of that, but uh, I think there, there does need to be more effort done on it and, and there is more room for improvement. But I think there are lots of people doing, doing good work. I mean, I was invited to the Polish school ceremony day there a few months ago and, and it was great in, in the Abbey, you know, to see all those young Polish children yeah. coming in and, and <coughs> honouring their culture and at the same time being involved in ours and, and playing a very active role in our community, you know, so th there's a fine line of trying to, you know, make them all Irish and that nobody wants them to be Irish, but I mean, you do need to help them and, and, and help people who's actually maybe offending them or ripping them off or abusing them. I think that's one of the things we could do. You mm -hmm. know, so. Very good. Um, and finally, Brent, can you give a message to people of Newry and Morn from Destination Yuri studio here today? Eh, well, I think Destination Yuri is is a small sample of, of the type of things that's going on in Yuri. You know, local people have an idea and they're going forward with it and it's touching all the lives west through the sporting medium and, and Destination Yuri would be very much up for that and, and involved in that, you know, from, from a sporting point of view is uh, I think the, the people of Newry need to be out there and particularly with councillors, you know, they, they need to like people that is going to fairly represent them and, and they need to see through some, some of the hype and they need to, they need to call their councillor. You know, so you know, sometimes I think people think councillors and the police have a crystal ball and they know everything's going on. Unless you ring somebody and complain to them and then get back to them. Because, I mean, I'll give you an example. If, if Tony Smith contacted me because he had a, a broken back door, I'll contact the local housing executive. They'll say, yeah, Brent, no problem, we'll sort that out. And maybe five times out of ten, they don't bother their backside. Mm -hmm. Tony Smith goes away with, with the attitude that Brent Corner never bothered his backside. And, and then he gets on to somebody else and somebody else. So, I mean, it's, it's a two-way thing. Because you've contacted in the first place, and or maybe... I mean, once, once I contact the housing executive official or the council official or the dole official, I'm assuming 
that they've done what they're paid to do. <coughs> but it's not always the case. So, and uh, you know, a message for the youth of today, Brent. Have you got a, you know, the, uh, due to um, you know the, the the economic situation. I mean, there's not much money going about. The I'm sure there's some very clever youth out there who would love to get going and create something big. You know, have you any message for these for the youth of today? Well, Newry is blessed with, I think it's the the biggest youngest population. And I mean, you've seen from all the schools, and it doesn't have to be the high schools that that there's a very high standard of, of education in Newry. I think people should stay where they can at home. I think this business of going away foreign is, is a false economy and uh, I think they should be trying to develop and, and assist the, the local businesses and, and staying in their own community where possible because there's a brain drain, there's a sports drain and, and there's a social drain and, and it's all to the detriment of Newry and when I, when I was growing up, you know, it was commonplace to go down. I mean, all my brothers were sailors, they all went to sea. And and Yuri was to the loss of that. So, where possible, you know, mm. where people can get their own businesses up and running or, or stick with the local businesses. And push people like the council to lever in more business and, and, and to get more jobs and, and to fight for more jobs. Because I don't think they effectively do that, or actively do it in any shape or form we're talking about. And then, in Newry, you have the Belfast Derry situation, or Dublin, you know. It never seems to happen in Newry. It always happens in those other places. Mm. So councillors need to be out fighting the corner to get the jobs, to get the investment. And people, I believe, are actively encouraged not to invest in Newry. And, and some of that is, is socially, and, and some of it from years ago used to be religious, you know, Newry wasn't a place to invest money and you seen factories would come, they would get the 10 year tax free grant and then the minute that was up they would, they would go away somewhere else, you know, mm -hmm. and, and people in Newry suffered just when they'd got to get in a lifestyle and then it was ripped out from under them. So Newry had a, had a feature that lots of other towns hadn't got where, where grown up men would stand around corners at night, it was places famous for it because there was no work mm -hmm. and, and the women didn't want them under their feet so men stood at the corner yarning and then maybe 11 o'clock at night they would go up home and, and t tomorrow would just be a repeat of that. And, and we're back in that workless era. But there is work out there and, and, and if people put their minds to it, there's, they can be inventive and, and they can create enough employment to keep them going until the good times come. Very good, Brian. Um, I think that about ties it all up today, Brian. I'd really like to thank you on behalf of Destination Reef for coming into the studio. And um, one final view, one final message for Anybody out there looking to, instead of saying somebody going away to emigrate to Australia, America or something, have you anything to try and keep them here or any advice for them, Brian? No, well, you know, wealth is only one part of life, you know, and if, if you can keep going, as I said, un until the good times come, I mean, emotionally you're leaving your family behind and all the rest of that, and, and sometimes it's good to go out there and spread your, your wings, but I mean, sometimes it's, you know, it's not so so glossy in, in the places that you go and, and, and sometimes there's hardship ahead as well. So you know, think it out well. Don't go unless you're sure. And and certainly don't go unless you have a means of getting home and and something to fall back on because, you know, you could be jumping from the from the pan into the fire. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. just just ease off. I mean, I know it's a there's a need at the minute and, and there's also a bit of a fad and you know, people don't say that. Yeah. You know, young people are gonna wait for that experience and that's great. But you know, sometimes people will take advantage of you out there and, and we've seen where, where other people have promised this and that and and it's not good intentions is behind it, so they just need to be very, very careful where they go and how they go about it. Very good. So just take it easy and be careful. Be careful out there. Yeah. Okay, well Brendan, thanks again for coming into the studio and uh, this is Tony Smith for Destination Yuri. Thanks again, Brendan. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you.